Hey there again, AP Environmental Science. Here we go with sustainability, economics, and equity. So that's nice to have an international view, but the United States as a whole, as a whole has a policy process. Uh, to be fair and effective, environmental policy should be based on scientific indicators that suggest a certain behavior or action that will be best for the environment. When policymakers believe that there's an adequate understanding of the science, then their course of action can protect states and individuals, and they basically begin the, to develop this, po this process and make policy. So there's five basic steps in a policy cycle um, that we have to identify the problem, formulate the policy, uh, policy adoption, and then policy implementation, and then, of course, the evaluation to see if the policy was effective. So this figure here shows um, that the process is kind of like a, a circular or um, it's reiterative. And it, as the policy is evaluated, its constant need to be amended um, is there. And so when an amendment is initiated, it follows through the same process all over again. And many good environmental policies have had numerous amendments, like the Clean Air Act has been amended at least twice. And even the original Clean Air Act of the 1970s has actually been modified it, uh, or modified it, mod modified uh, many times before it became legislation. The United States government agencies have tried many ways to protect the environment, you know, promote human health and safety and welfare, and in some cases, um, in, in, internalize these externalities that we've talked about. So the command and control approach is the strategy for pollution control that involves regulations and enforcement mechanisms. The incentive-based approach um, is a financial approach and other incentives for like lowering emissions based on the profits and the benefits and all that. Um, and there's so there's also like a combination of those pro approaches which are likely to generate better results. So taxation is a major <laughs> deterrent used to discourage companies from producing pollution and generating other negative impacts. There's a green tax, and a green tax is placed on environmental harmful activities or emissions, and basically an attempt to internalize some of those externalities, uh, charge the company for making uh, impacts on the environment, and they may involve um, a life cycle or even across lots and lots of products. But a tax alone may not be sufficient enough to achieve a desired result. And sometimes rebates and tax credits are given to individuals and even businesses uh, purchasing certain items like energy, um, like energy efficient appliances, uh, building materials, you know, eco doors, anything like that. So another technique is also what we call a, a cap and trade, um, and. It's discussed as like a uh, science applied. Can we solve the carbon crisis using cap and trade? Um, it's an article that came out here in like the late 1990s. Um, but anyway, in, in 1996, President Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development declared that uh, the essence of sustainable development is the recognition that the pursuit of one set of goals affects others and that we must pursue policies that integrate economic, environmental, and social goals. And we call that the triple bottom line. So if I were to look like at the definition of the triple bottom line, uh, it basically shows an intersection of three factors of sustainability. There are many organizations and businesses that place one of these three factors at like their priority. Some businesses strive for economic well-being, um, a sound financial bottom line, uh, or exclusion of human welfare, welfare for the environment. They may be regarded as successful within certain communities, but the triple bottom line concept emphasizes on basically the true success, and that is where the success story is. There must be adequate treatment of both uh, humans and the environment in order for it to be successful. Moving on to poverty and inequity. So there's a classic environmental dichotomy, jobs versus the environment. Those people primarily concerned with human well-being ask how can we make demands for environmental improvements when there's so much poverty and injustice in the world? 
And those concerned with the environment ask how can we just focus exclusively on human suffering when um, an impoverished environment cannot support a healthy human population and healthy well-being. Approximately one-sixth of the human population, that's more than a billion people, live in unsanitary conditions. And a lot of these are informal settlements like slums and shanty towns. And roughly one-sixth of the human population earns less than a dollar a day. And one-third earns less than two dollars a day. In the last hundred years, as developed countries have increased their GDP, um, many countries have modernized and developed their economies. Uh, there's definitely dis there's definitely differences between um, the rich and the poor. They've become a lot they've become a lot greater. Poverty is an issue of human rights, economy, and the environment, all summed together. Every human has the basic right to survival, well-being, and happiness. All directly can be threatened by poverty. You know, the United States is doing what it can, I guess, in order to improve these policies that promote sustainability and lessen poverty. Um, and this is uh, something that environmental science students often need to commit to memory. Um, we see this a lot in the FRQs and multiple choice questions as well, where students have to know um, dates and acts or laws and their purpose and some sort of example that contributed to the success of this legislation. So if I were you, you have this diagram, become very familiar with it um, and read it and understand it. The U.S. is involved in part, yes, but also the U.N. as we talked about earlier. In the year 2000, they developed this eight-point <clears throat> list of um, what member countries have agreed upon in order to no longer um, no longer ignore a lot of these issues with the environment. All right, so the members of the United Nations that signed this actual agreement and this list were basically declaring this. In 2015, there were goals um, that were put into place to uh, for these countries uh, to meet and accept. So. As of, as of today, some countries are well on their way to meeting all these goals, and others, of course, are very far behind. And as environmental laws are implemented, uh, the distance from resolutions as a result, um, not all developed countries have committed to these points on this slide here. The typical North American uses more resources than the average person in many other parts of the world. This situation is not equitable. The subject of fair distribution of the resources on the planet is known as environment, environmental equity, and it's received increasing international attention just here recently. Beyond moral objectives to inequity, there are concerns about sustainability, and we've seen how increasing resources uh, usually increases harm on the environment. So more and more people are developing like legit um, reasons and legitimate desires for better living conditions and having more access to resources on Earth. Not only is it distribution amongst countries, but let's just if we were to talk about just the United States, you know, we've talked that African Americans and other minorities in the United States are more likely than Caucasians to live in an area where there's like solid waste incinerators, chemical production, power plants, and basically all these really dirty industries. And in a number of studies in the 1980s, investigators used the distribution of minority residents by postal zip code to relate race and class to the location of hazardous sites. <laughs> it was a little messed up. And in Atlanta, even, 83% of African American population live within the same zip code as 94% of the uncontrolled toxic waste sites, while only 60% of whites live near those areas. And um, even in LA, roughly 60% of the Hispanics lived in the same area as the toxic waste sites, while only 35% of the white population lived close to those areas. One study in five southern states compared the size of a landfill facility with the percentage of minorities in that zip code area. 
Uh, the study concluded that the largest landfills are located in areas that have the greatest percentage of minorities. So an important issue that has not been entirely resolved is that, you know, this varies from case to case. Uh, what is affecting the population? Or are hazard facilities kind of relative to the given area or the population that's there? There are a fair number of individuals who believe that whether or not a government or a private agency are able to achieve their goals, individuals can and must act farther on their own goals for sustaining human existence on the planet. So these individuals have begun to make attempts to live sustainable existence without government incentives, taxes, or other measurements. And, um, you know, they have begun activities like calculating their own ecological footprint, carbon footprint, energy footprint, and other metrics in order to determine how much of an impact they're making on the planet. From this starting point, they have also begun to make changes in their own consumption, behavior, lifestyle, in order to reduce their impact. Some people act on their own while others act as a group or as an organization. They've adopted a philosophy that, represented, that represents a saying, if the people lead, the leaders will follow.